Hello, I'm Dr. Russell Barkley. I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. Welcome to my internet course. Before we begin, I'd like to show you my sources of support for the previous year so that you have some idea about any potential conflicts of interest that might exist in the contents of this presentation. During the past year, I've received a retirement pension from the University of Massachusetts Medical School, though I am not retired, obviously. I've also spoken in a variety of places internationally, and you can see the organizations that supported my presentations on the slide. I also receive product royalties for various products related to ADHD from a number of publishers and internet websites for seminars. And I also have worked as a speaker and as a consultant for a number of major pharmaceutical companies that have ADHD products in the marketplace. This course is about the adolescent and adult outcomes of children with ADHD. I will also discuss the treatment implications of these various domains of impairment as I describe them. This actually is the second part of a two-part course on the risks and impairments associated with ADHD. The first part of the course dealt with the risks associated with ADHD in children. This one, as I've said, will deal with the adolescent and adult outcomes of these children. Now, before we get started on these various domains of impairment, I want to explain to you a longitudinal study that I've conducted along with Mary Ellen Fisher and colleagues at the Medical College of Wisconsin. This is known as the Milwaukee follow-up study. The reason I want to discuss this briefly with you is that throughout this course I will be discussing some of the results of this longitudinal study and it may help you to have some idea about the methods that were used in the study. Beginning in 1978, I began evaluating 158 children between 4 and 11 years of age who at that time were diagnosed as having the hyperactive child syndrome but who today would be called ADHD combined type. These children were diagnosed by research criteria because there were no DSM criteria at the time that could be used in research projects. DSM-2 did exist, but it was not especially precise. And so we selected children who had significant symptoms of inattention, impulsiveness, and hyperactivity, much as would be required today in the DSM-4 criteria. We also required that they have symptoms that were developmentally inappropriate, and we measured this by giving the families the Connors Parent Rating Scale and also the Weary Weiss Peters Activity Rating Scale. Children were required to be excessive in their ratings on the scales. For instance, they were required to be at least at the 98th percentile on the norms at the time for the Connors Hyperactivity Index and to be at at least the 84th percentile in the norms for the Weary Weiss Peters Activity Rating Scale. They were also required to demonstrate behavior problems that were situationally pervasive, as measured by the Home Situations Questionnaire. The children also had to have an onset of their symptoms by six years of age, and we excluded a variety of conditions that you see here, including more severe forms of psychopathology. We also recruited 81 children from similar backgrounds, neighborhoods, and schools using what is called a snowball technique, which is simply where you invite people who are known to the ADHD children and their parents, and you screen them to determine if they are abnormal or not, uh, and then invite them into the project. And then from there, you ask them for friends of theirs, and so on, until you accumulate the control group. We use this procedure to make sure that the children in the control group came from similar backgrounds and even similar neighborhoods to the children that had ADHD. Now, we evaluated these children again at age 15, age 21, and age 27. The results I'll be discussing here are primarily from the age 21 and 27 follow-ups. Notice that we had very high retention rates for our control and hyperactive samples. Thus, the majority of individuals who began the study participated at these follow-up points. Now, at adulthood, age 27, ADHD was defined by modified DSM-4 criteria. By that I mean that we did not use the diagnostic threshold of six symptoms on either symptom list required in the DSM-4. 
That is because research has shown that this threshold is inappropriate for adults. Indeed, it is too excessive and corresponds to about the 99th percentile of the adult population. Studies have shown that a threshold of four symptoms is more appropriate for determining adult ADHD. This corresponds to about the 93rd to 95th percentile and is consistent with a similar level of developmental inappropriateness when applied to children. We also require that the individuals be impaired in at least one or more domains of major life activities out of eight domains that we examined. Using these criteria, we split the hyperactive sample into children who did meet the criteria for ADHD at follow-up and children who did not meet these criteria at the follow-up point. This is what we mean, as you see in parentheses here, by H plus ADHD. These were children who were hyperactive in childhood and who met the modified DSM-4 criteria at age 27. And then you see H minus ADHD, and those were the children that were hyperactive in childhood but did not meet these modified criteria in adulthood. As we will see later, some of these children were in fact placing within the normal range of the population suggesting that they had outgrown or recovered from their ADHD. Many others had remained symptomatic but simply did not meet all the criteria for the diagnosis. Now as with many follow-up studies, the majority of children in this study are boys and that is because boys at the time that the study began were more likely to be referred for ADHD by an average of about 5 to 1 relative to girls and that is the approximate sample that you see here. My collaborators in the Milwaukee study, as I've mentioned, were Mary Ellen Fisher, my co-principal investigator, and you'll see the other individuals who assisted us in this project on the remainder of this slide. I'm grateful to all of them for their years of assistance in helping us to collect information on this very important sample. You're probably wondering whether these individuals received treatment over the course of this study. They did, but the treatment was not provided in any systematic, randomized, or formal way as part of the project or by project staff. Instead, we simply documented the amount of treatment individuals were receiving in the community or through the medical school or children's hospital as they would routinely receive it across the life course of the study. You see here that most of the children had received medication during childhood. By age 15, more than 83% of them had received one of the two stimulants, and at least 18% had received the stimulant Pemeline, which is no longer on the market. But notice that on average, they were on medication for only approximately three years. Many had received various forms of therapies, particularly individual therapy, family therapy, or group parent training, and a small percentage had received group therapy or inpatient or residential treatment. This was the treatment that our groups had received by age 15. By age 21, notice that the vast majority of ADHD children were no longer receiving treatment, nor had they done so during their high school years, particularly with regard to medications. You can see here that only about one in four ADHD children was receiving medication in high school. The vast majority of these were receiving stimulants. After high school, by age 21, this rate had fallen to only about 1 in 7 uh, or so, about 13% of our children. And although some of them have received additional psychological therapies during their high school years or had received special educational services, after high school, only about 30% had received any form of such therapy. So largely, this is a group of children treated primarily in childhood, with the vast majority of individuals no longer receiving treatment by high school, and certainly not by age 21. By age 27, the rate of treatment participation was even lower than you see on this slide. The first question we're interested in is how persistent is ADHD? Many studies have looked at this question. Those that did not use any formal diagnostic criteria, which were usually studies done in the 1970s and early 1980s, found a rate of about 50% of individuals seen to persist in their symptoms over the first 10 years of the follow-up, that is to say, into adolescence. 
Once formal DSM criteria began to be used, however, we began to find that the rate of persistence was higher. That is because these criteria are more rigorous, I believe. In any case, it appears that at least 70 to 80 percent of individuals persist in having their full disorder over 10 years of follow-up into their mid-adolescent years. This does not mean that the remaining 20 to 30 percent have recovered or are normal. As I've indicated earlier, typically a certain percentage of individuals do recover. In this case, it's probably in the order of about 10 to 15 percent. With the remaining 10 to 15 percent having high levels of symptoms, but not sufficient to meet all DSM criteria for a diagnosis. By age 21, or young adulthood, our study found some rather interesting and contradictory results compared to other studies. Most other studies of ADHD children followed to this time had found that the vast majority of children had outgrown the disorder. This usually was somewhere between 3 and 8 percent of ADHD children were found to meet full criteria for ADHD by age 21. This, this is a remarkable rate of recovery between age 15 or mid-adolescence and young adulthood. We began to wonder if this remarkable recovery wasn't illusory. In looking at all of the methods of all of the studies that had followed children into adulthood, we discovered two common features across all studies. The first is that the individuals had stopped interviewing the parents by this age and had shifted to interviewing only the subjects themselves. We wondered whether this could be a problem. Is the source of information important in determining rates of persistence? You can see the answer to this question in the middle of this particular slide. Right about here. Here you can see we compare the results of our study for those who we had interviewed and for interviewing their parents. Notice that when you interview the participants who had ADHD at age 21, we found that only about, on average, 5% met full DSM criteria for the diagnosis. In other words, we replicated the results of all of the other studies. But then we also brought in their parents and interviewed them. And you can see here that the rate is at least 10 times higher, that is about 46%, meeting full diagnostic criteria when their parents' reports are used. So what this means is that it certainly does make a difference as to whom you interview in determining the persistence of the disorder. If you continue to use the parents' reports, which have been used throughout the entire follow-up study, then it looks like at least half of ADHD individuals continue to meet all DSM criteria by adulthood. If instead you shift and interview, interview only the patients, then only a very small percentage of individuals meet those criteria. The second issue is with regard to the DSM criteria. As I mentioned earlier, the DSM criteria were developed for children and were tested only on children, and therefore the diagnostic thresholds and even the phrasing of the symptoms may not be appropriate for determining ADHD in adults. In other words, it might be possible for individuals to outgrow the DSM criteria, but not outgrow their disorder. This, of course, requires that you have a different definition of disorder that you can contrast against the DSM criteria. The definition that we use as an alternative is known as developmental inappropriateness, or a developmental reference criteria. We decided to define adult ADHD as placing two standard deviations above the mean for normal adults in the amount of symptoms that individuals reported. This corresponds to about the 98th percentile. Once again, we interviewed the individuals about their disorder, and we also interviewed their parents. Now, as you can see down toward the bottom of the slide, about here, when we interviewed individuals who grew up with ADHD, only about 12% were at the 98th percentile in their reports of their ADHD symptoms. This is about three times greater than we found using the DSM criteria, but is still quite low. On the other hand, if you look here, you will see the results we got when we looked at the parent interviews. Now, about 66% of individuals with ADHD place in the top 2% of the population in their parents' reports. Contrast this 66% against the 46% here, and you see the problem with the DSM. 
the DSM fails to identify at least a third more individuals with ADHD who are developmentally inappropriate and therefore could be considered to have the disorder, but the DSM doesn't pick them up. To put it another way, if you were to use the DSM criteria as it's written, you would miss at least a third or more of all adults who have remained developmentally inappropriate but who don't meet those criteria. This suggests that in some cases people are not outgrowing their disorder but they are outgrowing the DSM criteria as it was designed for children. Another way of defining ADHD at adulthood is to look at the percentage of individuals who were in fact functionally impaired in at least one or more domains of the eight domains that we examined in our interview. And you see that figure here. Now you can see that at least 85 to 90 percent of the children in this study were impaired in at least one or more domains. Now an important question arises here. Whose reports should you believe? Should you believe the children who grew up with the disorder? After all, they're now adults and perhaps they are the best observers and reporters of their own behavior. On the other hand, you've been using the parents' reports throughout the entire follow-up study, and perhaps they remain the most important or most valid sources of information. To understand this, or to test this idea, we took the parents' reports and correlated them with eight different major life activities, that is to say, with measures of impairment in those activities. We also did the same using self-reports. This gives us some idea of whose reports are more likely to predict impairment in major domains of life activities. What we found is that the self-reports predicted very little with regard to impairment or across domains of impairment. On the other hand, the parents' reports were much more highly correlated with degree of impairment in all domains and were a fine predictor of pervasive impairment across many different domains. So if predicting impairment is a sign of validity of reports, then clearly the parents' reports remain more valid than do the self-reports. This suggests that clinicians who are evaluating individuals at least up to age 21, and we will show even up to age 27, should always interview individuals who know the patient well and not rely exclusively on self-reports. Because as this information suggests here, individuals will under-report their degree of symptoms of ADHD at least until young adulthood. So in short, we would recommend that you always corroborate the reports of people with ADHD against others who know them well in order to avoid this pitfall or trap of under-reporting of symptoms and also of impairments. Now the next question is what happens by age 27 in our longitudinal study? Very few studies of ADHD children have gone out this long. On this slide you will see the results for age 27. In fact what you see here are the results throughout our entire follow-up period. So let me explain what these results represent. At age 21, which you see here, these were the results we just described. And you can see that we have carved up ADHD by different definitions, which I show over here on the right. So let me explain each of those. This dark blue line represents what we would call syndromal ADHD, which is whether or not the individual meant full DSM criteria for the disorder. The next two lines, the light blue and yellow lines, represent a developmental definition of ADHD. The light blue line represents the 98th percentile, which we talked about earlier, and the yellow line represents the 93rd percentile, or one and a half standard deviations above the mean. Now look at the gap between these two lines, the light blue and yellow line, and the dark blue line. That gap, or difference, is the problem with the DSM. By that I mean that it shows that many individuals remain developmentally inappropriate in their symptoms across the lifespan, but the DSM demonstrates more and more difficulties in detecting them. Or as I said earlier, you can outgrow the DSM criteria that you see here, but not necessarily outgrow your disorder 
if we define disorder developmentally as being inappropriate in your symptoms. Finally, take a look at the red line at the bottom of the slide here. This represents the percentage of individuals in our follow-up study with ADHD who we're now placing within the normal range in the degree of their symptoms. And by that, we required that they fall at least one standard deviation or less around the mean for our control group. And you can see that a small percentage of individuals are beginning to show some normalization of their symptoms. This slide shows the actual numerical results that were used to create the graph. Most important, I'd like you to look at the last column on the far right for the age 27 results, and you can see the numbers here. You can see that twice as many individuals met the developmental definition of ADHD, either at the 98th or 93rd percentile for adults, than did those who met the DSM criteria. This difference is the problem in the DSM criteria that the DSM-5 is going to need to correct in order to make sure that the criteria remain developmentally inappropriate, or excuse me, remain developmentally sensitive into adulthood. At the bottom, you see the percentage of individuals who fell within the normal range in their symptoms, which we generously defined as placing at the 84th percentile or lower. And then finally, you see in parentheses those who not only fell within the normal range of symptoms, but who also were no more impaired than the average individual in our control group, which is to say they had either one or fewer domains of impairment. What that table suggests is that about a third of individuals with ADHD by their parents' reports may be recovering from the disorder. But now let's take a look at what happens when we switch back to use self-reports we see the opposite trends in our report of symptoms. Instead of a decline in symptoms over time, we are seeing an increase in symptoms, no matter which definition of ADHD we employ. This suggests that people growing up with ADHD are becoming more aware of their symptoms in their early adult years, after age 27, or after age 21, excuse me. And no matter which definition we use, we see this increase in perception of ADHD symptoms. Now, there are many reasons why this increase in self-reported symptoms might take place. It could be that many of these individuals have moved away from home and are beginning to get feedback from their friends, cohabiting partners, or from their employers about their behavioral difficulties. And so now they can no longer simply blame ADHD on their parents as they did in their earlier years. In fact, at age 15 and 21, most of these individuals did not believe they had ADHD at all, even though their parents had brought them in for an evaluation and they had been diagnosed by professionals as having the disorder. But notice by age 27, more of them are beginning to wake up and realize that they may be having some symptoms. Another reason for this increase could be neurological. The frontal lobe of the brain, which is where self-monitoring is located, particularly in the anterior cingulate, the frontal lobe continues its maturation up until the late 20s to early 30s. And so it is possible that some of this degree of recognizing ADHD, that is this increase in recognition, could be based on continuing neurological maturation. Individuals are beginning to become more and more self-aware, and therefore they're becoming more aware of their own symptoms. It's possible that both of these explanations apply to these data, but no matter what we see here is not contradicting what the parents are reporting. In fact, it represents convergence. If we were to compare the two graphs that I've shown you here, that of the parents' reports showing a decline and that of the self-reports here showing an increase, what you would see is that they are beginning to converge on the same point at age 27. The people with ADHD who grew up with it are beginning to agree with their parents about the degree of symptoms that they may have. This degree of agreement probably continues for a few more years into the early 30s. In other words, the older you are with ADHD, the more your self-reports will start to agree with the reports of others about you. But prior to about 27 to 30 years of age, 
these reports frequently do not correspond with each other, which is why I have recommended strongly that you always obtain the reports of a collateral, that is, of someone who knows the person well, in addition to obtaining self-reports. We did try to examine if there were any predictors of persistence of the disorder or of recovery from the disorder by the age 27 follow-up. We were not able to find any predictors that we considered to be clinically meaningful. There were a few predictors that did rise to the level of statistical significance, but this showed that they only had a small degree of predictive influence. So although they were statistically significant, they accounted for only a very small percentage of the variance or likelihood that an individual would recover. One of the predictors was, of course, the severity of their ADHD at the prior evaluation. The more severe their ADHD was and the more it had lasted into adulthood to age 21, the more likely they were to continue to be ADHD later on. We also found that educational level was uh, of some predictive value, but again, only to a small degree. Individuals who had graduated high school were less likely to have ADHD in adulthood than individuals who did not graduate high school. But this is simply a reflection of the severity of the disorder, of course. The point here is that we were not able to identify any substantial predictors of recovery, at least not using any of the measures of psychological or social factors. This actually is very similar to what Joseph Biederman and his colleagues at Massachusetts General Hospital have found in their own longitudinal study. Uh, and that is that there are very few, if any, good predictors of outcome. They found three predictors that were statistically significant, but like our study, did not appear to account for a lot of variance in the outcome. Again, severity of ADHD at the previous assessment the extent to which the individual had at least one or more other psychiatric disorders, and the degree to which mothers were experiencing various forms of psychopathology, all appeared to conspire to contribute to a further persistence of disorder over time. But again, the conclusion from these studies, and from many other studies as well, is that there are few, if any, strong or reliable predictors of the persistence of ADHD into adulthood. Perhaps that is because all of these studies have examined psychological, psychiatric, or social factors. None of them examine neurological measures or genetic measures of ADHD. It may be that particular genes or particular patterns of neurological development are much more predictive of whether ADHD persists into adulthood. As you know from my course on this website with regard to the etiologies of ADHD, we know that ADHD is one of the most striking neurogenetic disorders in psychiatry. That is, neurological and genetic factors contribute strongly to the etiology of the disorder. And perhaps these same factors are also determining how likely the disorder is to persist into adulthood. Indeed, very recently, studies have shown that individuals with certain versions of dopamine genes in the brain are more likely to show a faster rate of development of the frontal cortex than are individuals who lack that particular version of the gene or have a different version. So perhaps genetic factors might be involved in the degree to which the disorder persists. Future research hopefully will be able to address that question. Now we want to take a look at the various domains of impairment that we examined in our study and that have been examined in many other longitudinal studies as well. One of the most frequently examined outcomes for ADHD children is the impact the disorder has had on their educational outcomes and their functioning across their educational years. The results you see on this slide represent the results of the other longitudinal studies and of the Milwaukee study as well. Now you can distinguish between these sources of information very quickly, if you'll just look at the first line of the slide up here. When you see a range of statistics, as I'm showing you here, which is 20 to 45 percent, that is the range that was found for grade retention in all of the other longitudinal studies. And when you see numbers after the acronym MKE, those are the results of my Milwaukee longitudinal study. Here you can see that 42 percent of the children had been retained in grade at least once 
in our longitudinal study in the hyperactive group, while only 13% of the control group had experienced grade retention. Now, before I continue further to discuss these results, I do want to note the results of other studies of grade retention that you see here. These studies indicate that grade retention is not beneficial to children for the most part, and indeed what little benefits there might be, such as on academic achievement tests the following year, do not appear to persist for very long. Most studies, in fact, indicate that grade retention is probably harmful to children. For instance, the Pagani study showed that grade retention was associated with an increase in aggressiveness in boys, depression in girls, peer relationship problems the following years in school, a loss of interest in learning, and a greater likelihood of dropping out of school. These results held up after controlling for all other sources of information about the children, such as the severity of their behavioral difficulties, their academic functioning before retention, and so on. So it's fairly clear that grade retention is at least associated with future harms that individuals might experience. My own Milwaukee study found much the same thing. Indeed, grade retention was associated with an increased risk of dropping out of high school, controlling for all other possible explanations we had available in our data set, such as the severity of ADHD, the severity of conduct problems, family factors, and so on. These results suggest that individuals should not look at grade retention as a means of helping children in their educational performance. And this would apply to all children, by the way, not just to ADHD children, because the Begani study and the Hauser Review of the Literature dealt with children of all stripes, not just those with ADHD. So in other words, it is not helpful to simply repeat a grade in hopes that the child will pick up the information the following year as a result of their being somewhat more mature in their growth and development than if you had simply promoted them. I'm not arguing for social promotion here, which is simply passing children along regardless of how they're doing. What we are arguing for, at least those of us who have done some of these studies, is that people need to intervene right away to assist the children with the problems they're having. Grade retention is not an intervention. So we are not arguing for ignoring the children's problems, but quite the opposite, for getting in and aggressively assisting these children with whatever their problems might be that led the individual to consider the need for grade retention. Now to continue on down the slide, you can see a variety of outcomes of individuals in their educational performance across these various longitudinal studies. Notice, however, at the middle of the slide, the rate of individuals who were likely to have dropped out of high school, which you see here. The reason I focus on this outcome rather than the others is because of the economic impact as well as the social and emotional impact this has on individuals and their communities going forward. For instance, it has been estimated by health economists that children who do not complete high school cost their communities approximately $375,000 to $475,000. This is the accumulation of lost wages, lost taxes paid to the community, lost value added to the community, and an increase in dependence on various social service, welfare, and other forms of assistance provided by the community. So having an individual not complete high school is very expensive for the surrounding community, which must bear the burden of that failure to graduate. Notice in the Milwaukee study that about 32% of the children we followed did not complete high school, whereas virtually every child in our control group did so. Overall, about 9 to 11 percent of the U.S. population fails to graduate high school these days. Those figures, of course, vary as a function of what state you examine and so on. But suffice to say here that it appears that ADHD results in an individual being three times more likely to fail to complete high school than we would expect in the general comparative population. Now, also consider the number of jobs that have now been closed off to the individual and the number of opportunities to succeed that are not available to them anymore because they lack the entry diploma or criterion needed to gain access to those jobs, having a high school diploma. That is also what I mean by the social and emotional impact of the disorder. 
the individual is going to find themselves having progressively fewer opportunities in life as a result of failing to complete compulsory education. Even those who completed education were often likely to perform well below that of our control group, and you can see those results on the rest of the slide here with regard to their class ranking in their final year of high school, with regard to their grade point average as you see here. By the way, this grade point average reflects, reflects basically a D plus to a C minus as their overall grade point average in their final year of school, whereas this reflects about a C plus to a B minus for our control group. Notice that very few of our children entered college, and even fewer graduated college, relative to the general population or to our control group in this study. What all of this means is that ADHD results in individuals being less educated by the time they reach adulthood than are individuals from similar backgrounds, neighborhoods, and schools. Now in this graph you see the results of the Milwaukee study specifically at age 27. The results in the previous slide reflect the results from age 21. The most important point that I want to show you here has to do with regard to the comparison among the three groups. Remember that we've divided our hyperactive children into those whose ADHD persisted, as you see here on the right, into those whose ADHD had not persisted, that's the white bar, and then there is our community control group as well. Let's look over here at the percentage of individuals that graduated high school. This is on the far left of the graph. You see here that whether an individual's ADHD persisted or not to age 27 did not seem to matter. Both groups have an equivalent degree of failure to complete high school relative to our control group. You see very much the same thing here in terms of grade retention and also over here in terms of the percentage of individuals that had received special education during their formal schooling. And finally, look back over here at those who graduated college. Notice that the two groups are not all that different. What this pattern seems to suggest is that it doesn't matter whether you outgrow your ADHD or recover from it or become simply symptomatic but no longer diagnosable. Whether or not you recover from ADHD, the disorder appears to have an adverse effect on your educational outcome, psychologically scarring you for life in a sense, as these consequences of ADHD will persist throughout life. Your educational attainment follows you, and unless you go back to get further education or to make up for the education that you didn't get, this problem of ADHD affecting education will be pernicious and persistent into adulthood. This graph reflects the percentage of individuals in our study who continue to have a learning disability at age 27. Here we defined a learning disability as falling at or below the 14th percentile on standardized academic achievement tests. And you can see here again we have our three groups of persistent ADHD, non-persistent ADHD, and the control group. And if you look across the bottom of the slide here, you can see the various learning disabilities that we measured in this study. Here we see that individuals with ADHD, whether their ADHD persisted or not, continued to experience a higher rate of learning disabilities than in our control group. Indeed, it looks as if learning disabilities are quite persistent over time. Now, what does all of this mean for the future management of ADHD with regard to these educational problems? I think, first of all, it means that there is a clear need to educate teachers and school administrators about the high risks associated with ADHD and its adverse impact on the educational course of children. ADHD is a very impairing disorder when it comes to getting through the school system. Second, of course, we need to educate teachers specifically about the forms of behavior management that have been found to be very useful in helping ADHD to behave better and to succeed more in the educational setting. For more information on specific forms of classroom behavior management, please take my course on school management of ADHD on this website. I also believe that 
these results argue for creating an ADHD school liaison in each public school. This could be a master teacher who has many years of experience with special education students, particularly those with ADHD, who has gone on to get some additional training in ADHD specifically, and then who is available as a consultant to all other teachers in the school should they be having difficulties managing children with ADHD in their classrooms. This is a very inexpensive procedure. It doesn't require formal special education. One simply has a consultant available in each school who can go and consult to other teachers prior to any referral of the student for formal educational review, evaluation, or special educational services. This teacher can give advice to other teachers on what they might try to do in order to manage the specific problem a teacher is complaining about. Now this school liaison could also serve as a consultant to parents. And by this I mean that if you had a child with ADHD attending a particular public school and you wanted to know how they were doing, you wouldn't keep calling all of the child's teachers or the school administrators. You would just contact this ADHD liaison and they would go and gather the information from the relevant teachers and call you back and let you know how your child was doing or if there was a problem, what the school would propose to do about it very quickly. In other words, how this teacher would consult with the other teachers and what they would advise. This is sort of like a patient representative in <coughs> excuse me, the hospital system, where if you're unhappy with your care as an inpatient in a hospital, you can call the patient representative and they will mediate the bureaucracy and get information about your complaint and come back to you and let you know what they found and, if there's a problem, what the hospital proposes to do about it. Schools that have adopted the ADHD liaison approach find that the number of complaints of parents about the school drops significantly and the number of lawsuits likely to be filed against the school also declines. Parents and teachers report themselves to be much more satisfied with how that school deals with ADHD children as well because of the availability of this expert consultant. Now our results also indicate that people with ADHD, that is children, should be screened at kindergarten for ADHD as they register for the kindergarten year. It only takes about three minutes to screen a child using a rating scale of ADHD symptoms and these rating scales have remarkably high accuracy rates Children who pass the screen, on average, are likely to have ADHD about 70 to 80 percent of the time or more when they are referred on for a more thorough psychological evaluation. The remaining 30 percent or so are not normal, but are usually children who have other disorders that are causing disruptive behavior at school, uh, even if this is not ADHD. So these screening instruments are quite inexpensive, not very time consuming, and do a reasonable job as a screening tool of identifying individuals who may be at risk for ADHD. If a child were to be identified as being at risk, a more formal evaluation could be done to determine the nature of the disorder they have, most likely ADHD, and then recommendations could be made to the school right away as to how to begin to address the child's difficulties as they enter the school system, rather than waiting several years for the child to fail before they come to professional attention. Now as I've mentioned under the concept of the school liaison, you can also help to intervene with ADHD in schools by providing pre-referral informal advice to regular classroom teachers on behavior management methods. This can be done by other people in the school, by school psychologists, or by professionals outside the school who are involved in the child's care. You can also make adjustments to the curriculum to adjust the program for the particular needs of that ADHD child in addition to just using behavior modification methods. Of course, if none of this succeeds, then the child can be referred for formal special educational evaluation and services under the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, or under Section 504 of the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, in order to assist these individuals. I also believe that these results indicate that we need to begin medications earlier in the life course of children in order to help forestall or preclude their adverse effects of ADHD, that is the adverse effects of ADHD going forward. 
These days, the average age at which children are referred and placed on ADHD medications is around 8 to 10 years of age. Some children are referred earlier, some are referred later, but that is the typical age at which we intervene with medication. Notice that that is about three to four years after the child has entered formal schooling. That's three to four years of lost education that is unlikely to be made up or compensated for by starting medication earlier, or, or later, excuse me. So by this I mean I think we would have a much more uh, effective impact on ADHD in the schools if we were to consider instituting the ADHD medications earlier in the life course of children. I also recommend that individuals use the extended release delivery systems for these medications in order to cover the entire school day by a single dose. In earlier decades, it was more common to give the regular preparations of medication, the pills that is, and these regular preparations, often called immediate release preparations, would only last about three to five hours. And therefore, ADHD children often had to take their medication two to three times a day at school, creating a, the opportunity for social stigmatization, uh, and not only that, but also proving quite disruptive to their school day. It also meant that schools had to store medications, some of which are scheduled to medications that may be potentially addictive or have uh, possibility of abuse potential. By using the once daily delivery systems, schools are no longer placed in this position, children are no longer being exposed to this sort of stigma, and their school days are not being disrupted by the need to take repeated doses of medication. Finally, on the last line of this slide, you'll see that I strongly recommend that we provide ADHD children with vocational assessment as they enter high school and begin to train them in certain technical or job skills during their high school years. I recommend this whether it appears that these individuals are likely to go on to college or not. Because of the high rate of dropout of ADHD children, we want to ensure that even if they drop out, they have at least acquired some technical skills and are therefore more likely to be employable than is now the case. Now, we could do this for all adolescents, not just those for ADHD, but certainly I think that those with ADHD are likely to be the ones to benefit from this practice because they are likely to be the ones who are most likely not to graduate high school. Examine the employment difficulties that have been found in various longitudinal studies. And as you see here, many studies find that ADHD children enter the workplace with less education, less skill, hence my recommendation about vocational training during high school. We also find that they are likely to go through periods of unemployment, that is, more frequent periods of unemployment than are seen in control groups. For instance, at my longitudinal study at age 21, three times more ADHD children were unemployed during the previous three-month period compared to our control group. And you can see at age 27, the figure wasn't all that much better, particularly for those whose ADHD had persisted to age 27. One in four of these individuals did not have employment during the previous three-month period. Other studies have found not only these results, but that people with ADHD in the workplace are more likely to take advantage of sick days, to be underproductive during more days of the work year, and to be out of role, which is to say not performing the job they're supposed to be performing uh, during that work year. All of this is to say that ADHD clearly has an impact on occupational performance, and this impact is also going to have an economic impact on their employer. Now, we also found that ADHD individuals were much more likely to be fired or dismissed from employment as a result of misconduct than were individuals in our control group. You can see here that at least twice as many of the ADHD individuals had been fired from a job compared to the control group by age 21. By age 27, that figure was about 43% for those whose ADHD had persisted, and only slightly less than that for those whose ADHD had not persisted. We also found that they were fired from three times more jobs than other individuals. So although they are more likely to be fired, they are also more likely to be fired from more jobs than other individuals without ADHD. We also found that they change jobs more often of their own volition. Most of the time they reported that they'd become bored from a job and simply quit it on impulse to see if they could go find other employment. 
you can see here that individuals with ADHD quit twice as many jobs over this sort of uh, situation than did individuals in our control group. By age 27, you can see here that, again, the figure is about twice as many jobs quit on impulse over that period of time, whether their ADHD had persisted or not, relative to the control group. Now, we also took steps to obtain evaluations of our ADHD children from their employers. We did this by telling the employers that we were simply doing a job satisfaction survey in order to keep the employers blind to the purpose of the study and to the diagnosis of the individual that we were following. And we found that the supervisors of these individuals rated the ADHD individuals as displaying significantly more symptoms of both ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder on the job than was the case in our control group. We also found that these supervisors rated the ADHD individuals as performing their work at a lower quality than individuals in our control group. By the end of our follow-up study at age 27, individuals with ADHD held jobs of a lower status and placed in overall a lower socioeconomic bracket using their income, education, and job status to determine that income and economic bracket relative to the control group. So over time, individuals with ADHD are progressing more slowly up the ladder of socioeconomic success than are individuals without ADHD. One study, that by Sal Mnuchin colleagues in New York, has also found that there appears to be a greater drift towards self-employment as individuals enter their early 30s with ADHD. About one in three individuals in their study was self-employed. Now, this could simply be a byproduct of all of the previous failure that they've experienced in working for others. This slide makes obvious what those problems might be. But it also <coughs> excuse me, might reflect the possibility that individuals with ADHD might find self-employment to be more conducive to their ADHD, that is, to be less impairing. In self-employment, an individual is their own boss, so they can't be fired. They can also work at their peak hours of productivity, even if that happens to be afternoon or, or evening hours, rather than having to conform their schedule to that of their employer. Often when you're self-employed, you seek self-employment in an area that you find to be rewarding, enjoyable, or one in which you're particularly successful or effective. And so it may be that self-employment offers this sort of latitude to pursue one's own interests and therefore one is less likely to be impaired by their ADHD in that workplace situation. Now here are the results from the Milwaukee study at age 27. Once again, we're going to compare our three groups that you see here, persistent ADHD, non-persistent ADHD, and our community control group. Now if we look at the overall pattern here, it's a little different than the pattern that was seen for educational performance. Here we find, for instance, in having trouble with others on the job, that it is individuals whose ADHD persisted that are primarily having the greatest difficulties. And we see that across many of these other areas. For instance, being disciplined on the job over here was primarily a problem for individuals whose ADHD had persisted. So it looks here as if it's primarily in the ADHD persistent group where workplace problems are likely to continue. Those who are starting to outgrow their ADHD or at least become uh, subclinical or just symptomatic may be having greater success in the workplace. Nevertheless, there were certain situations, as you see on this graph, where it really didn't matter whether the individual's ADHD persisted or not. For instance, look here at the center bar on likelihood of being fired even people whose ADHD was no longer diagnosable continue to have a much higher rate of likelihood of being fired from a job than individuals in our control group, even though it is lower than you see here in, that, in the persistent group. So overall, ADHD, if it persists, continues to pose problems for many individuals in the workplace. Now what does this mean for trying to address these occupational difficulties? 
Well, as with school, I believe the first thing that should be done is to educate employers about the nature of ADHD so that they understand it not as a moral failing or someone simply choosing to slack off and not do their work or be disorganized, but to understand it instead as a disability, as the neurogenetic disorder that it clearly is. This is why individuals with ADHD are eligible for workplace accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, because it is recognized as a disability. Educating employers about ADHD may make them more amenable to providing these workplace accommodations. But one has to be careful here because it's been our experience, that is my colleagues and mine, in consulting with ADHD adults that certain employers are likely to become more hostile toward the individual if they disclose their diagnosis and request accommodations. And these hostile employers may take more formal or systematic steps to discipline the individual uh, or to accumulate enough adverse findings about them to get them dismissed from employment. So one has to be rather careful about to whom, that is to which employer, one discloses this diagnosis or not. I also think that the vocational training I mentioned earlier under educational risks would help to address this problem of vocational, or excuse me, of occupational difficulties as well. Individuals with ADHD who would get vocational training would be better prepared to enter the workplace and might have fewer workplace difficulties than those who did not. Certainly counseling teens and young adults about ADHD-friendly jobs would seem to be useful. For instance, there may be certain professions that are a bit more forgiving of ADHD symptoms or in which those symptoms are less impairing. Consider the military, for instance. The military provides much greater structure assistance and support and training to individuals, but also requires or provides uh, much greater feedback and even discipline if necessary. It's quite possible that this added structure of the military may be of some benefit to some individuals with ADHD. Indeed, this may explain why more ADHD individuals are found in the military than in the general population. It would have to do with this sort of self-selecting into this niche where the person perceives that they may be less impaired by their disorder. Certainly, I have counseled a number of young adults to consider the military as an option, especially if they are not considering going on to college, as a place where they can go, get more training, and perhaps be less impaired by their disorder in that particular occupation. Many adults with ADHD seem to find their performing arts, or the visual arts, or stand-up comedy, or door-to-door -door sales, or other such active and expressive occupations to be those more friendly to their disorder. That is to say, they appear to be less impaired within those occupations than in others. And as we've already mentioned, self-employment may also be a particular niche in which individuals with ADHD might find themselves doing better or at least being less impaired. There are likely other occupations as well. For instance, one study in Portugal found that individuals with ADHD in college were more likely to be opting into the physical education curriculum or into college athletics than were other undergraduates coming into college. And it may be for much the same reason. This major in college allows more activity, more versatility, is less demanding of executive functioning and self-discipline, and therefore may be an area of specialization in which ADHD is less impairing. Notice also that I recommend that if vocational training has not been provided in high school, then perhaps it should be provided now after the individual has completed high school through a two-year community college or technical training program. The individual could then, if they wish, go on to college afterwards uh, or may find that this is simply enough education for them to succeed at finding gainful employment. As I've mentioned previously, ADHD adults are eligible for workplace accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, but they must disclose their diagnosis and provide adequate documentation of a professional evaluation before employers are required to make any accommodations. And the law clearly states that these accommodations must be reasonable, as you see here on my slide. The employer is not required to provide every accommodation the individual might request. If you wish to know more about workplace accommodations, you can take my course on this website with regard to the diagnosis and management of ADHD. 
but needless to say here that many of the, the techniques or the adjustments that we recommend for use in the workplace are very similar to the sorts of behavior management and organizational methods that we recommend that people use in school settings. Lastly, let me recommend yet again that these results provide more evidence for why medication management should be started earlier in the life course of individuals. And certainly if they are already adults and are already employed, we need to make sure that medication covers the entire workday. Uh, and this is best done, I believe, by using the extended release delivery systems of the various ADHD medications. And indeed, some individuals may be working longer hours that go well beyond the usual time course of the extended release formulas. For instance, certain ADHD medications last about 8 to 10 hours, but some individuals may be working 10 to 12 hours or longer. So physicians can supplement the extended release medications with the immediate release tablets if it is necessary to um, keep the individual on medication for several hours after the extended delivery system formulation has expired. One area that has been studied extensively in ADHD teens and adults in uh, major life activities is the operation of a motor vehicle or driving. This is an area that I've spent a considerable number of years investigating as well. We have found that it doesn't matter at what level we evaluate driving, we find that ADHD interferes with an individual's ability to operate a motor vehicle. For instance, even at the very simple level of how well they coordinate the vehicle, steer the vehicle, keep it in the center of their lane, how quickly they react to events taking place in their visual field, such as their as reflected in their braking reaction time and so on, ADHD even interferes with driving at this rather molecular level of driving ability. We've also found that using ratings of safe driving habits, that both self-reports and the reports of others indicate that people with ADHD are less safe drivers. We have also, in our Milwaukee study, use driving instructors to evaluate the driving of individuals during a one-hour driving course throughout the city of Milwaukee and surrounding suburbs. These driving instructors reported that they had observed these ADHD individuals being less attentive and more impulsive during their driving than was the case in our control group. These driving instructors, by the way, did not know which individuals in our study were in the ADHD group or in the control group. Using other methods of evaluating driving impairment, we continue to find that ADHD interferes with driving and poses grave risks in some cases. For instance, we found in a number of studies that people with ADHD were more likely to drive as early adolescents before they were legally allowed to drive. That is, they would take their parents' car before they had acquired a driver's license and go out driving when their parents weren't home. Obviously, this poses significant risks both to the ADHD teenager and to other individuals, given that the ADHD teenager has not been trained to drive at this point. Over their first eight to 10 years of driving, people with ADHD have two to three times more auto accidents or crashes than do people in control groups. Indeed, they are likely to have multiple crashes during their driving career, as you see here. We also found that they had four to five times more speeding citations during this first eight to 10 years of driving than was the case in our control group. The accidents that they had were worse as measured by dollar damages. As you see here, the accidents caused by individuals with ADHD in our studies were two to three times more severe in the damages that they caused and in the bodily injuries that they caused in the accident than was the case in our control group. So it's no surprise that over the first eight to 10 years of driving, our studies found that people with ADHD were three times more likely to have their license suspended and have it suspended at least three times more often than individuals in our control group. Now you can see here as well that several studies have shown that ADHD is associated with a more adverse impact of alcohol on driving than is found in even normal individuals. Now we all know that alcohol does have an adverse impact on a person's ability to operate a vehicle, but we found that this adverse impact occurred earlier in the dosing curve in our study 
than was the case in our control group. In other words, it took less alcohol to detect the impairing effects of the alcohol on our driving measures than was found in our control group. That is because individuals with ADHD obviously are already impaired in their driving before they even consume any alcohol, and the alcohol just contributes to a further worsening of their driving, even at very low doses of alcohol. What are the implications of these results for driving? Well, first of all, I believe that we need to educate parents, teens, and especially primary care physicians about this domain of risk so that when patients enter the age at which they are now eligible to learn how to drive and operate a motor vehicle, that parents of these individuals be advised about these risks and have the teenager participate in a more graduated licensing system, staying longer at the level of the learner's permit, not being allowed to have other teens in the car, being allowed only to drive during daytime hours with adults for about three to six months, during that time, if they are able to handle driving without any significant incidents, then their licensing might be broadened to include driving at night or driving with other teenagers and so on. More than 20 states in the United States have such a graduated licensing approach for all teenagers, but I would certainly recommend that this be required of people with ADHD, whether the state requires it for teenagers or not. One of the greatest causes of accidents, even among the normal population, is driver inattention, particularly within vehicle distractions. And this has become increasingly so with the advent of cell phone technologies and text messaging. So now individuals with ADHD have another source of distractibility that may worsen their driving beyond what it would have been prior to the invention of these devices. One means of dealing with this problem is to acquire technology that blocks the use of a cell phone in a car. You'll see one of these devices here, and I'm sure there are others on the internet. This device is called the key to safe driving. Uh, and this device, when it is used in a car, blocks all cell phone transmissions within the car. The device looks like that of a key ring. The individual attaches the uh, key of the vehicle to this key ring and it folds into the device itself. When the key is out of the device, that is when you flip it out like a switchblade knife and you use the key to start the vehicle, the device begins to transmit a signal blocking the use of the cell phone until the key is removed and placed back inside the device when it shuts off the signal. This is a very clever way of blocking the use of cell phones while an individual is driving. Other recommendations, of course, have to do with having parents supervise the use of the vehicle more closely than they might otherwise do. Keeping a chart at the back door or near where the keys of the vehicle are hung on the wall. This chart then is used to uh, document where the teenager is going, how long they're going to be gone, uh, what's the purpose of the trip, uh, and whether or not other people will be involved. And then this chart can be used for random spot checking of the teenager by calling around to find out where they are, are they at the destination where they're supposed to be, who are they with, and so forth. One can also install within the vehicle a small GPS monitoring device uh, that can then be used to track the location of the vehicle and even its speed using a home computer. Many commercial businesses such as UPS, the phone company, FedEx, and others already use such devices in order to track where their vehicles are and where their drivers are when they're out using the vehicle. So this is a rather affordable technology for families to use in tracking the use of the car with an ADHD individual. Also a company called DriveCam has manufactured a camera with a solid state recording device that is a solid state memory device and this camera simply is attached to the rear view mirror. It has one camera lens that faces the roadway and another camera lens that faces the driver. And if there is a sudden change in motion of the car, either a sudden acceleration or sudden stop, the camera drops the last few seconds of driving, usually it's the last 10 seconds, I believe, onto the hard drive. Now when the individual gets home, parents can download information off the hard drive and watch it on a computer and examine the critical events that took place while the teenager was driving. In fact, you don't even have to wait for the teenager to come home. 
you can attach a device to the camera and it immediately transmits any significant events back to a uh, monitoring device such as a home computer using a uh, cell phone signal. In any case, this is one means of monitoring teenagers with ADHD while they are out driving a vehicle. Some insurance companies, in fact, are already willing to provide these devices at no charge to families whose teenagers may be insured by these insurance companies. Another way of helping to increase supervision of the vehicle is through behavior contracting. Several programs are available uh, to help families do this. For instance, I have a program called Safe Driving that is available through Jones and Bartlett Publishing. Maureen Snyder has a book out on this subject as well with some behavior contracts within it. Uh, and this is available through the addwarehouse.com. All of this is simply a means for developing an explicit contract with the teenager about how the vehicle is to be used, where they are going, what they are doing, and then consequences are embedded in the contract for following the contract or for violating the contract. Now once again, I strongly recommend the use of ADHD medications while individuals are operating a motor vehicle. Driving a vehicle is a life-threatening activity, and indeed I have had both personal experiences with family members as well as with patients where family members have either been injured or in the case of my ADHD twin brother killed in driving accidents as a result of being off their medication while they were operating a motor vehicle. It has often been said that statistics are people with tears wiped away. Think about that when you recall the statistics I gave you on the previous slides about driving. These statistics look rather benign uh, and certainly are devoid of this sort of personal meaning. But each and every one of those statistics is in fact a tragedy. Uh, and we certainly don't want to have these tragedies befalling our patients or our family members if they were avoidable. And I think using medication at all times when an individual is operating a motor vehicle if they have ADHD is a good recommendation. The Canadian Pediatric Society has in fact adopted as one of their practice guidelines just such a recommendation. In Canada, if a pediatrician evaluates a teenager and finds that their ADHD is at least of moderate or greater severity, it is now strongly recommended that these teenagers be on medication while they learn to operate a vehicle and as they drive a vehicle later on. Lastly, you can see at the bottom of my slide, of course, that Given the results of the alcohol research on driving and ADHD, we would suggest that people with ADHD avoid the use of alcohol entirely while they are operating a motor vehicle. Now another area of outcome is to see whether or not psychiatric disorders persist over time. ADHD individuals are very likely to have a second and even a third psychiatric disorder besides their ADHD. In my course, on the psychiatric comorbidities of ADHD on this website, you would have learned that 80% of children and adults referred for ADHD are likely to have at least one other disorder, and more than 50% of them are likely to have at least two other disorders. And so it's very common for people with ADHD to have at least one other disorder. We talked about these childhood psychiatric comorbidities in part one of this course, on risks and outcomes associated with ADHD. That was the course that, de that dealt with childhood risks. When we followed our Milwaukee children up into adulthood, we found that a number of them continued to have oppositional defiant disorder. Now because this was detected by self-report, it is our belief that this figure would be at least three to four times higher had we used the reports of other family members about the individual's behavior. This was also the case for conduct disorder. But nevertheless, even based on self-reports by age 27, a significant percentage, though a minority, of our ADHD individuals were reporting that they met criteria for these disorders. About one in four individuals reported having depression at some point prior to age 21. And you can see down toward the lower part of this information here that even at age 27, about 18% of individuals whose ADHD had persisted to that age uh, were experiencing problems with some form of depression, usually depressive personality disorder at that age, versus about 6% of individuals 
whose ADHD had no longer persisted. Now people do not often think that suicidal ideation, or suicidality as it's called, is linked to ADHD, but our results show that it is. Here you see that during high school, about 50% more individuals in our ADHD group had reported thinking about suicide relative to individuals in our control group, which you see over here. Now notice even in the control group, suicidality, that is suicidal thinking, is relatively common. And that has been found to be the case in the CDC and other studies of adolescence and suicidal ideation. But what you see here is that having ADHD increases that risk by another 11%. Now this risk declines after high school by age 20, 21 to 27, but still remains relatively higher than one sees in the control group. More importantly, what we found in our study is that ADHD is even more associated with the likelihood of attempting suicide. For instance, look here. If one had thought of suicide, 16% of our ADHD individuals attempted it. And although you don't see it here, the attempts that they made were significantly worse as measured by the need for being admitted to a hospital following the attempt. Now notice that this is five times greater than the risk of suicide attempt had a member of our control group thought of attempting suicide. So ADHD results in an individual being more likely to attempt suicide if they think of it than another individual. And we believe that this is a result of the impulse control problems associated with ADHD. Fortunately, as you see here, the risk declined significantly after high school and up to age 27, though individuals with ADHD are still twice as likely to attempt suicide if they think of it. Luckily, the overall absolute percentages have now declined and have become only in a small minority of individuals as a risk. Now in this slide, you see the other psychiatric disorders that we documented in this study. For instance, we found a growing increase for anxiety disorders in our patients followed to adulthood. And this risk was clearly related, as you see here, to whether or not the ADHD had persisted versus non-persistent ADHD. In the non-persistent group, the risk of an anxiety disorder was no greater than we found in our control group. Overall, what this suggests is that the longer ADHD persists into adulthood, the greater the likelihood that an anxiety disorder may develop alongside it. Now, many studies have documented the risk that ADHD poses for development of a substance use disorder or a substance abuse disorder by adolescence or adulthood. And you can see that risk clearly here in our Milwaukee study. Individuals with persistent ADHD were three times more likely to have developed such a disorder than our control group. And even individuals whose ADHD did not persist to adulthood were still more than twice as likely to have developed such a disorder. Now oftentimes research shows that this risk is mediated entirely by the development of conduct disorder by age 15. And we did find that to be the case as well. But we also found that even in cases where conduct disorder was not present, people with ADHD were still more prone to using certain substances more than other individuals, and even to abusing those substances. And the substances we found that were linked to ADHD explicitly, or specifically, were alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. So whether or not conduct disorder is present, these three substances appear to be excessively used, and individuals may in fact develop an a dependence or abuse disorder for these various substances. Now, the reason for using tobacco has been explored in some detail, and results of research suggest that this is a form of self-medication. We know that nicotine is actually beneficial for the management of ADHD symptoms. And so what is found in these studies is that if someone with ADHD starts smoking, they will increase their rate of smoking more quickly and will smoke more frequently than even other individuals who are likely to turn to smoking. We believe that this reflects self-medication. The individual is finding the nicotine to be beneficial to management of their ADHD, but of course they're using a highly addictive substance to do so. Now the use of alcohol and marijuana requires a different explanation. These drugs are not beneficial to ADHD and in fact may make some of the symptoms worse. 
For instance, one of the initial effects of alcohol is disinhibition. If you're already impulsive and you're drinking alcohol, you may become even more impulsive than normal during the early stages of alcohol intoxication. Marijuana, on the other hand, is known to affect the ability to sustain and focus attention, and therefore marijuana use would be likely to adversely affect that dimension of ADHD symptoms. It may be the reason that ADHD individuals are more likely to use alcohol and marijuana has to do with the desire to forget their troubles, that is, to develop a sense of well-being that comes from using these substances, artificial as that sense may be, because of the greater likelihood that they are experiencing difficulties in their life. We know that alcohol, and possibly marijuana, result in a telescoping of time inward, that is to say a constriction of one's time perception. As one drinks, one becomes more and more focused on the now, and less and less likely to be paying attention to, or be aware of, the yesterdays and tomorrows of life. And therefore one is likely to feel better by focusing on the now than would otherwise be the case if they were not consuming these substances. Whatever the reason, it's very clear that people with ADHD, even in the absence of conduct disorder, are more likely to be using substances and to be abusing them, in fact. Now, we did find that the use of harder drugs, such as morphine, heroin, methamphetamine, crack, cocaine, and so on, was related to the presence of conduct disorder by age 15, as well as to the degree to which individuals were affiliating with deviant peers who also were antisocial and also likely to be using drugs. Also, we found that individuals who were doing poorly in school or who had dropped out of high school were more likely to be turning to the use of these harder substances uh, than individuals without these risk factors. So it's very clear that conduct disorder and these other factors are predisposing individuals to even greater drug experimentation, dependence, and abuse with more substances than is the case when ADHD occurs alone. And you can see here, lastly, that substance use disorders were likely to be present in teens uh, and was related if they had a history of childhood maltreatment and if their parents also had a substance use disorder. That is to say that substance use disorders were more likely to be present in the teens who came from those backgrounds than teens who did not. Now, very few studies have examined personality disorders in ADHD individuals, but ours is one of the few. And what we found is that ADHD predisposes to the development of five personality disorders. Now, please notice over here that the majority of individuals with ADHD did not have a personality disorder but they were more likely to do so than our control group uh, in this study. The five disorders, as you see, are antisocial personality disorder, passive aggressiveness, avoidant, borderline, and paranoid personality disorders. Looking at the antisocial personality disorder line here, you can see that people whose ADHD persisted, that's this figure here, were more than twice as likely to develop antisocial personality disorder than those whose ADHD had not persisted, and were clearly more than seven to eight times more likely to have developed antisocial behavior or personality than our control group. And by the way, that's what these figures mean here. The first figure in parentheses is always the persistent group, the second is the non-persistent, and the third is the control group. Now, what we found in further analyses is that all of these personality disorders listed here were entirely the result of conduct disorder. If a teenager had developed conduct disorder before 15 years of age, they were more likely to have these disorders than people with ADHD who had not developed a conduct disorder. Notice here other studies have also found our link between ADHD and borderline personality disorder. And you see here uh, the two-way risk between these two disorders. For instance, in our study, we found that 30% of those with ADHD that persisted age 27 met criteria for borderline personality. Now, notice down here, studies have found that about 40% of people who have borderline personality disorder are likely to have ADHD. In other words, it's a two-way street, or what we call bidirectional comorbidity. Each disorder increases the risk of having the other disorder. Notice here, in a study of women with borderline personality disorder, that at least 41% had, 
had ADHD as well, very consistent with the results of this other study. And also they found that about 16% uh, who had borderline personality disorder had ADHD by adulthood rather than at childhood. All of this is to say that these two disorders seem to link up with each other. More recent studies suggest that, in fact, the impulsiveness that is often attributed to borderline personality disorder is not really the result of that personality disorder. It's a result of the overlap of that personality disorder with adult ADHD. And indeed, one study suggests that where ADHD occurs with borderline personality disorder, it creates a unique subtype of borderline personality from the routine form of borderline personality that occurs without comorbid ADHD. Now on the next slide, you will see the percentage of individuals in our follow-up study that had engaged in various antisocial activities by age 27. I could also show you a graph of the frequencies, uh, but these would be extraordinarily high. The point here is this. Individuals with ADHD are more likely to engage in various forms of antisocial activity that you see represented along the bottom of this graph than are individuals in the control group. Now once again we see that individuals whose ADHD persisted, that's the black bar, so let's take a look at the stolen property line here, people whose ADHD had persisted were more likely to engage in this behavior than people whose ADHD that hadn't but even they were more likely to do this than individuals without ADHD at all. So once again, we see that it's persistent ADHD that carries the greatest risk of engaging in antisocial behavior across the lifespan, but that even those whose ADHD no longer persists to age 27, there is still a greater risk for some of these antisocial activities than is the case in the control group. You may in particular be interested in arrest rates and in the likelihood of having been jailed at least once by age 27. And you see that in the last two bars uh, on the diagram. And here again we see that persistent ADHD is more likely to be associated with being arrested or imprisoned than is non-persistent ADHD, but even that carries some risk with it relative to the control group that you see here. Now the Milwaukee study continued its analyses of those data further by looking at how crimes relate to each other. It may appear to you that there are at least 10 or 12 different kinds of antisocial activity that were represented in our study, but if you conduct a factor analysis, it boils down to about three underlying criminal dimensions. One of those dimensions is predatory crime, and that is preying on other people, fighting with them, mugging them, carrying and using weapons, confronting victims, and so on. Our analyses showed that this form of predatory activity was related entirely to the presence of conduct disorder. Severity of ADHD was not a predictor of that outcome. The same was true with a category of crime that we called self-sufficient crime. This is crime that is associated with running away from home as an adolescent or young adult. And as a result of not being able to take care of yourself, the individual steals money or engages in prostitution and therefore uses those antisocial activities to try to support themselves. Once again, we found that only conduct disorder was associated with the likelihood of this form of antisocial behavior. Severity of ADHD did not predict this outcome. Finally, you see here what we already found previously on an earlier slide on drug use disorders, and that is ADHD was related to the dimension of crime known as drug-related criminal activity, which specifically refers to whether or not the individual possessed, used, or sold drugs, or whether they had stolen money or property to obtain drugs than had other individuals. ADHD is related to this type of antisocial activity. So is conduct disorder, of course. Both of them made independent predictions of risk after controlling for the other. So there is an area of adult criminal activity or adolescent antisocial activity that ADHD is related to and that is drug-related activity. Now this slide shows the results of a study which my own research has subsequently replicated that has to do with the economic impact of these antisocial activities on a community. Here you see a study that computed the costs 
uh, to the public of mental health services, special education, juvenile justice, uh, and other crime-related activities in ADHD teens over a six-year period versus youth who did not have ADHD. And you can see here that the cost of the community is about $40,000 per teen relative to the cost of the community for a non-ADHD youth. So ADHD is more than twice uh, as expensive to a community with regard to juvenile justice activities, antisocial behavior, uh, and as you see here, the need for mental health services and special education. My own study found very much the same. Now notice down here, the $40,000 figure that I've just shown you is for an ADHD teenager. This is the figure for an ADHD teen who develops conduct disorder. It nearly doubles the cost of services that are going to be needed to deal with this individual in that community. So having ADHD is an expensive disorder for a community to uh, have within it, and having ADHD with conduct disorder makes that doubly expensive. Now, what are the implications of all of this with regard to comorbidity for clinical care? First of all, complex or comorbid cases are going to require more extensive evaluations and are likely to require management by mental health specialists in clinical psychology and psychiatry than is likely to be the case as to what services can be provided by primary care physicians or by educators working in the school system. So in general, where there is a second or third disorder comorbid with ADHD, we strongly recommend that primary care individuals and school systems consult with specialists in the field of mental health disorders for the evaluation and management of those disorders. Second, it's clear that additional psychosocial treatments are going to be required to address the additional psychiatric disorders that are linking up with ADHD over time than just the treatments that are traditionally recommended for ADHD alone. In other words, comorbidity with ADHD increases the need for additional treatments. It also increases the need for additional medications that may need to be combined with ADHD medications in order to treat the comorbid conditions. For instance, ADHD medications are not useful as treatments for depression. So where depression develops in conjunction with ADHD, as it does in at least one out of every four cases, one is likely to have to use interventions for depression in order to deal with that comorbid disorder. Treating the ADHD alone is unlikely to address it. Now where individuals develop conduct disorder or serious antisocial behavior, I highly recommend that, in, uh, that clinicians consider employing multi-systemic thera therapy as developed by Scott Hengler and his colleagues here at the Medical University of South Carolina. This is a very intensive intervention in which therapists visit homes of individuals daily for several hours a day in order to provide a multitude of psychosocial services for these individuals. That is because these are often multi-problem families from which the antisocial youth are coming. And so therapists need to be trained in a variety of empirically based treatments in order to provide services to these families. Such services are provided on a daily basis for around six to nine months. And while this certainly sounds very expensive relative to routine outpatient care on a once a week basis, it is less than one fourth the cost of incarcerating these individuals. And of course we know that incarceration has not been shown to improve the futures of individuals so incarcerated, whereas multisystemic therapy does appear, at least in its initial data, to have a positive impact on likelihood of recidivism among antisocial ADHD youth. Obviously, many individuals with ADHD who have engaged in antisocial activities will come in contact with juvenile justice authorities and even with rehabilitation services. I strongly suggest that you consult with these colleagues about ADHD as very few of them have received training in this psychiatric disorder, in its diagnosis and its management. But I do believe that ADHD will interfere with the likelihood that an individual is responsive to various interventions and rehab services within the juvenile justice system if their ADHD is not treated properly. Indeed, I think ADHD should be treated well ahead of conduct disorder or other disorders because it's often the first disorder to develop. And because it is a disorder of self-regulation, it is also likely to interfere with the individual's receptiveness uh, and ability
ability to participate in subsequent interventions that are trying to address the comorbid disorder. The same is true when working with police or criminal courts where you may be called upon to provide expert testimony about the individual. This is an opportunity to educate the police and the courts in the nature of ADHD, its linkage with antisocial activity, and the need to treat the ADHD if the individual is going to have uh, any increased success in responding to the other interventions that may be recommended for dealing with the criminal conduct. For more information on comorbidity, as I've said, please take my course on Optimizing ADHD Treatment, the Impact of Comorbidity uh, for more details on these disorders. Some longitudinal studies, such as my own and those uh, that have taken place in Canada and elsewhere, have monitored the social outcomes of individuals with ADHD. And as you see on this slide, by adulthood, there is a continuation of the social problems that were documented in childhood, as discussed in part one of my course on outcomes that dealt with the childhood risks of ADHD. We also find that when these individuals marry, they report lower levels of marital satisfaction, as do their partners. They also report a higher likelihood of having extramarital affairs outside the marriage than do non-ADHD individuals. And there may be an association between ADHD and partner conflict, if not partner violence, particularly where conduct disorder is present in conjunction with ADHD. <coughs> Pardon me. My own studies also indicate that ADHD is associated with earlier parenthood, that is, with earlier bearing of children. Indeed, individuals with ADHD are likely to start having their children five to ten years earlier than does the general population. As I'll show you momentarily, people with ADHD are ten times more likely to have had a child before 19 years of age than is the case in our control group. So this early likelihood of becoming young parents is also a factor to consider in the future risks associated with ADHD. We have also found that where ADHD individuals are parents, they report much higher stress in their role as parents associated with their ADHD than is the case in control groups of parents. As this slide, slide shows, ADHD predisposes towards certain sorts of lifestyle uh, opportunities. That is to say that people with ADHD are more likely to be engaged in uh, social networking, talking on the phone, text messaging, watching television, playing video games, and socializing with others than they are to be involved in further development, self-improvement, time spent reading, getting extra education, exercising, and health maintenance. Indeed, one study found that children with ADHD by adolescence were more prone to video game dependency, or what is called internet addiction, than were individuals in their control group. So what we see here is a rather sedentary lifestyle devoted to socializing or to playing games or to more entertaining and fun activities rather than being devoted to self-improvement over time. The Milwaukee study also documented an increase in money management difficulties by age 27 relative to our control group. Once again, you see our three groups here, the ADHD persistent, the ADHD non-persistent, and the community group. And you can see here that it's mainly the persistent group that is reporting higher rates of financial management difficulties than are individuals, the white bar, whose ADHD did not persist to adulthood. Yet even they report higher rates of difficulties, such as problems managing their money, problems with impulse buying, missing payments on their rent, and having a poor credit rating, as you see here. Even they report more such difficulties than is seen in our control group. All of this is to say that adult ADHD is associated with more difficulties with financial management and with poorer credit rating than is seen in our control groups. Now, as I mentioned earlier, ADHD is associated with an increased risk of teenage pregnancy, but it's also associated with a greater likelihood of leading a lifestyle of risky sexual activity. The Milwaukee study and other studies have not documented an increased risk of sexual disorders being associated with ADHD, 
but they have documented a riskier lifestyle. For instance, in our study, teens with ADHD started their sexual careers, that is, had sexual intercourse, about a year earlier than was found in our control group. This was even more likely if the individual had conduct disorder. We also found that they had more lifetime sexual partners up to the age 21 and 27 follow-up than had people in the control group. Notice nearly three times, that is at least two and a half times, the rate of sexual partnering during this early sexual career than in the control group. And notice that they had had at least four or more partners by age 27 in 60% of the ADHD individuals versus only about 28% of the control group having that number of different sex partners. We also found that they had more partnerings during the prior year than the control group, but that they spend less time with each partner, probably because their relationships are less likely to persist over time. We found they had more casual sex even outside of committed relationships that they reported being in, that they were less likely to employ contraception, and as a result, no surprise, they were more likely to have experienced a teenage pregnancy. And indeed, this was even more the case with girls with ADHD than with males with ADHD. Overall, we found that nearly 40% of our teenagers had either initiated a pregnancy as the father or experienced a pregnancy as the mother relative to our control group. This is eight to 10 times greater than that found in control groups. So it appears that ADHD is one of the best predictors of teenage pregnancy that has been discovered. Certainly conduct disorder is also a predictor as well, but both of them make independent contributions to risk for early parenthood. You can see here the number of babies that were born to the ADHD group by age 21, 37 relative to the number that had been born to the control group, which was one. A very dramatic difference in the likelihood of being a parent at a young age. And notice here in our ADHD group that more than half of them did not get custody of the baby after it was born. The baby was either taken home and cared for by the grandparents of that baby, that is the parents of the ADHD youth, or the baby was put up for adoption. We also found, as you see here, that by age 27, the likelihood of being a parent just continued to increase. 51% of the children we followed age 27 were now parents versus only 13% of our control group. We also found that by age 21 and continuing on to age 27, people with ADHD were four times more likely to have cont contracted a sexually transmitted disease. Overall then, the pattern that we see here is one of a much riskier sexual lifestyle than that seen in the general population. What are the implications of this lifestyle for clinical care? First of all, once again, parents need to be educated about these risks as their children enter the age of becoming sexually active. Primary care individuals, such as pediatricians and family practitioners, also need to be taught about these risks so that they can provide this information on to their patients. There may also need to be involved social service agencies at this time as well, particularly if the teen has become pregnant or has become uh, an uh, unwed parent. And then finally, of course, there is the need to counsel parents and physicians about the risk associated with sexually transmitted disease. We would recommend that parents of ADHD teenagers supervise these teenagers more closely, particularly when they are engaging in dating activities. And in fact, we would encourage parents to forestall dating among their ADHD teenagers in favor of what is now called group dates, where a large group of individuals may, for instance, go to the movies uh, or uh, have a uh, sleepover at a teen's house or so on, uh, rather than have uh, individuals going out on dates alone with uh, a partner. So delay couples dating in favor of group dating activities with multiple peers uh, as long as possible in addition to providing greater supervision. Obviously educating teens uh, about sex and contraception and these risks uh, is one approach to dealing with these difficulties but it's our opinion that just providing education alone is unlikely to alter these risks since they appear to be associated primarily 
with the impulsiveness of ADHD. So parents may need to introduce their teenagers to contraception uh, earlier than might be the case in the general population uh, in hopes of reducing these risks. Now there are no studies of the issue, but it's possible that using ADHD medications throughout adolescence might reduce the impulse of conduct and increase the self-regulation of these teenagers, and that might carry forward into a reduced risk uh, for these various adverse sexual outcomes. This is unknown, however, as there are no studies of the effect of medication on this domain of major life activity. Now finally, I would recommend that people who have ADHD children, at least by the time these children are teenagers, might wish to have their children inoculated against the human papillovirus. These immuniza immunizations are now available for both girls and boys. The reason for this recommendation is that people with ADHD are likely to have more sex partners across their sexual careers than other individuals. And we know that it's the number of sex partners that is associated with the risk for cervical cancer in women. And therefore, knowing that there is a greater risk of sex partnering with multiple partners across their sexual careers, one might want to reduce this risk of cervical cancer by early immunization against the HPV virus associated with cervical cancer. Now, our studies have also documented a number of medical and health risks associated with ADHD, and you see them here on this slide. The risk of accidental injuries documented in ADHD children continues into adulthood, as does, therefore, the risk of likely uh, being admitted to the emergency room, utilizing ER services, more frequent hospitalizations, and the driving accidents that we've already mentioned. There is also a growing risk for medical and dental problems because of poor preventive medical and dental care that I spoke about in the earlier childhood lecture. We also find that there is greater use of workman's compensation and disability services by ADHD adults by adulthood. Sleep problems documented in childhood may be likely to continue uh, into adulthood in those with ADHD. Interestingly, eating disorders have now been documented as a particular risk for females with ADHD. We know that ADHD predisposes toward childhood obesity, but studies are now showing that it may even predispose toward bulimia or the impulse eating disorder in adolescents and young adult females who have ADHD. And you can see some of the risks here on the line for eating disorders. Girls with eating disorders were two to three times or more likely to develop an eating pathology, particularly bulimia, than were girls who did not have ADHD. One study found that the risk of developing bulimia in an ADHD girl was predicted by the risk factors that you see on this line of my slide. That is, earlier and more severe impulsiveness, peer rejection, exposure to harsh, harsh parenting, and comorbidity from major depression, anxiety disorders, or oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. My own studies have also found that adults with ADHD are more likely to report higher rates of somatization, particularly if they have an anxiety disorder with their ADHD. Somatization here simply means complaining about vague medical complaints for which there may be no physical basis. In addition, we have also found that people with ADHD, as noted earlier, have a greater likelihood of smoking and using alcohol and other substances than other individuals. Such a greater propensity for drug use is another risk factor for cardiovascular disease in addition to the growing likelihood of obesity now already reported on the previous slide. Indeed, the Milwaukee Longitudinal Study is the only study so far that I'm aware of that actually evaluated the uh, lipid profiles uh, and future risks of coronary heart disease uh, in our longitudinal study. And here you see that we found that people with ADHD had worse lipid profile ratios, that is, lower good cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, a higher ratio of total cholesterol to their HDLs, uh, a greater risk for having uh, atherosclerosis, uh, and a greater future risk for coronary heart disease using the Framingham point system for scoring future risk based on current lifestyle. So even at the tender age of 27, people with ADHD are already beginning to diverge from the general population 
in risk for future coronary heart disease. And certainly the aforementioned increased use of smoking and alcohol portends a greater risk for cancer in mid to later life if that lifestyle were to continue. Overall then, what all of this means is that ADHD may shorten an individual's life expectancy if it is not treated early and if those treatments are not sustained as long as the disorder and impairment from the disorder uh, is present. Putting together all of the consequences we've talked about, one could argue that ADHD may shorten an individual's longevity. This is not hypothetical. Already there are studies that have shown that children with externalizing disorders, as you see here on the last line, which includes ADHD, are three times more likely to be dead at age 46 than are individuals in the general population. And you can see that the risks grow with the severity of the um, underlying externalizing disorder. Also notice up here on the second line, the study by Friedman, colleagues, and others that have shown that childhood conscientiousness is associated with a reduction in life expectancy, that is to say an increased risk in death by all causes. Conscientiousness is the personality dimension associated with self-regulation and impulsivity. And the Friedman study shows that individuals who were below the 25th percentile in conscientiousness had seven years less uh, life expectancy than individuals who were not in this lower quartile. Now imagine ADHD is not just the bottom quartile of the population, it's the bottom five to seven percent of the population, which would suggest that the reduction in life expectancy might be even greater in individuals with ADHD. So overall then there is a general pattern that suggests that uh, longitudinal studies may find a reduction in life expectancy associated with ADHD, meaning that ADHD is actually a public health disorder, not just a mental health disorder. Now the implications of these health risks are numerous, but they have not been explored in any research. Nevertheless, there are some common sense suggestions that could be made on the basis of the data accumulated so far. The first is once again to educate our primary care colleagues who are seeing the large majority of ADHD children and adults about these risks. There is also a need to educate government health care agencies at the local and state level and even at the federal level about the health care risks that are associated with ADHD and the benefits that might accrue to these risks if interventions were started earlier and sustained longer across the lifespan. We also need to encourage the ADHD individuals themselves, along with their families, to engage in better use of preventive medical and dental care and to increase their attention to their lifestyle, that is to engage in health maintenance more often than other individuals are likely to do in order to reduce these risks. We would also advise that people with ADHD be given greater assistance with the management of both legal and illegal substances. We know that ADHD predisposes people to use of tobacco products and to do so at a higher rate than other individuals. And so smoking cessation programs are going to be more likely uh, to be needed for people with ADHD. Also, as we've talked about, the greater need for alcohol abuse treatment programs, not to mention substance abuse rehab programs, given the earlier data that suggests that ADHD is a specific risk factor for the development of these substance dependence use and abuse disorders. We also need to talk with parents and with teenagers and young adults with ADHD about the data accumulated so far that their lifestyle is likely to be associated with greater coronary heart disease or cardiovascular risk and with greater risk for cancer during their midlife years if they continue on the road that they may have chosen with regard to their lifestyles. So assistance with nutrition, with smoking cessation, with alcohol use, with preventive medical and dental care, and so on needs to be directed at these individuals along with encouraging them to adopt a healthier lifestyle uh, in order to reduce these risks further. Again, no studies have explored these recommendations for whether or not they would be uh, effective. But nonetheless, the data available so far clearly implicate the need for such interventions. 
So I hope you can see from this lecture that we can conclude that ADHD is a highly persistent disorder and that anywhere from 65 to 86 percent of individuals clinically diagnosed in childhood will be diagnosable in their early adult years. We do document that some individuals may recover from ADHD. Indeed, the Milwaukee study found that between 14 and 35 percent of people with ADHD had either completely recovered by age 27 or had become less symptomatic to a point where they were no longer diagnosable. Nevertheless, the majority of people with ADHD will persist in having their disorder into adulthood. I've also shown you that ADHD is associated with numerous risks in childhood, adolescence, and adulthood for impairment in numerous major life activities. Indeed, our data suggests that ADHD is among the most impairing outpatient disorders in psychiatry that we currently treat. More individuals with the disorder are impaired in each domain that we've examined, and they are impaired in more domains than other individuals with outpatient disorders such as anxiety disorders, depression, learning disabilities, relationship problems, and so on. That's not to say that there are not more impairing psychiatric disorders. There certainly are. But relative to what is treated routinely on an outpatient basis, this is a very impairing disorder. Fortunately, the finding suggests that ADHD is among the most treatable psychiatric disorders currently known. That is to say that we have more treatments for this disorder than are likely to be available for other disorders, that more individuals are likely to respond to these interventions, and that the degree of improvement produced by these interventions is likely to be greater than that seen for other outpatient psychiatric disorders. Consider, for instance, the treatment of anxiety and depression with anti-anxiety and antidepressant medications. The ADHD medications provide two to three times greater change in ADHD symptoms than those drugs are likely to do for anxiety and depression. We also know that a higher percentage of individuals respond to these ADHD medications. Studies indicate that from 75 to 90 percent of individuals will respond to at least one of the ADHD medications in the marketplace currently. So we have more treatments. These treatments produce more improvement and do so for a greater percentage of individuals than is likely to be the case in other areas of outpatient psychiatric treatment. So it is not that we don't have interventions for ADHD that work. The biggest problem that we have with ADHD, as was mentioned by the Surgeon General some years ago, is that our interventions are not started early enough, they are not sustained long enough, and they may not even be available to many individuals in the population. Then uh, would be the case uh, in uh, uh, situations, for instance, uh, in urban areas, where we may find greater resources available for individuals. So it's the patchwork of services, is what I'm trying to say here, uh, of ADHD services geographically that is the problem. So we have treatments that work. It's getting them to the individuals who need them and getting them to the individuals to use longer across their lifespan than currently is the case. For instance, we know that 30 to 40 percent of individuals with ADHD in childhood are not diagnosed and treated. And we know that 90% of adults with ADHD are not diagnosed and treated specifically for their ADHD. Indeed, only 25% of them are ever diagnosed and treated for any disorder. So it really is the recognition of ADHD and then the provision of care that is the biggest problem that we currently have, at least in the United States, with regard to ADHD management. So I hope you've seen that ADHD produces a rather wide swath of adverse impairments or adverse effects across the lifespan and across more domains of major life activities than is likely to be the case for other outpatient psychiatric disorders. I hope that you've learned something from this course about the risks posed by ADHD and that you've come to understand that ADHD isn't just a mental health disorder, but a public health disorder as well. Thank you for taking this internet course. I invite you to take other courses that I have prepared on this website at your convenience on the topic of ADHD. I would also like to invite you to visit my publisher's web website, which is guilford.com, to learn more about the latest products that I have for dealing with ADHD and for
for its assessment. Thank you again for taking this course.